Hi, my name is Connie Lukanis and you're watching the video Thyroid Eye Disease Management. In this video, we will be discussing uh, the management of patients who have been diagnosed with thyroid eye disease and we'll talk about uh, various non-surgical and surgical options and also medical options in relation to patients um, with this disease. Now, in relation to the management of patients with um, thyroid eye disease, we could divide this into four categories. One, we have uh, the medical management of the thyroid dysfunction. So if a patient has a thyroid dysfunction, this will need medical attention. Then we have patients with general ocular involvement. So where, for instance, the cornea is being affected, that will need attention. Then we have a series of patients who may have the optic nerve which is being threatened by compression and there's a series of management options for these patients. And then finally, those who have the extraocular muscle involvement whereby it's resulting in diplopia and uh, restricted eye movements, then again, these patients need um, some attention as well. It should be noted here that in terms of um, surgical treatment, we try to avoid surgical treatment in these patients until they are euthyroid. So in other words, they've got a normally functioning um, thyroid and we're out of the wet phase. Um, the only time that surgery does occur prior to this point is if the optic nerve is at risk. In other words, the site is being threatened and then um, that warrants looking into uh, surgical options for these patients to um, prevent the optic nerve and vision or the optic nerve being compressed and vision uh, being lost. Let's start off with the medical management of a patient with uh, thyroid dysfunction. Uh, now, depending on whether they're hyperthyroid or hypothyroid, uh, management will differ. And remember, most of the patients with thyroid eye disease will be hyperthyroid. Now, irrespective of um, what type of thyroid dysfunction the patient has, the endocrinologist and you as the orthoptist and the ophthalmologist will be reinforcing with the patient that they must stop smoking if they are a smoker. The endocrinologist is the individual or the doctor who will be managing the thyroid dysfunction. And you can see here I've given you a cup, two columns here of the type of medication or the type of treatment that hypothyroidism um, or the type of treatments used in hypothyroidism versus those used in hypothyroidism. With hyperthyroidism, um, we see here that some of the common um, options are prescribing drugs that will reduce the thyroid function. They may use uh, radioactive iodine to irradiate the thyroid gland. And lastly, a thyroidectomy could be uh, performed where the thyroid is excised. And then with hypothyroidism, one of the most common um, treatments is hormone replacement to increase um, uh, the thyroid function. And, and thyroxine is one of the most um, commonly uh, prescribed drugs in that instance. Okay, now let's move on to patients with more general ocular involvement and what do we do in these um, instances. So you'll recall that exophthalmos or proptosis is an issue in these patients and we've got also um, the lid retracting, in which case uh, we can get corneal exposure and uh, ocular discomfort and usually we'll have drying of the corneal epithelium. This could lead um, to loss of visual acuity if um, if we end up in a severe uh, case. So depending on, on the severity of the instance, the management may vary, but the options range from prescribing artificial tears, obviously in a, in a less or mild, uh, less severe or mild case, lubricating ointments. You can also put Botox in the levator, which will improve um, retraction also, and uh, lower the lid and assist the patient um, or assist the patient's cornea. And then uh, there could be surgery as well where lateral tosorophies are performed to uh, assist the patient with uh, corneal exposure. In relation to lid retraction, or where again this could be the reason why we're getting corneal epithelium um, drying, there is the option of uh, surgical intervention in relation to the lid. And here uh, there is a disinsertion of the overacting Muller's muscle or a lengthening of the contracted um, levator muscle can also assist these patients in relation to their cornea. 
Okay, let's move on now to patients who potentially may have optic nerve involvement. So you'll recall from the previous video that um, where we have an increase in orbital volume and an expansion of the extraocular muscles, and we can see here on the scan to the right that the smear rectus is very large and potentially compressing on the optic nerve there. This is the lateral rectus here, and that looks... Um, uh, relatively normal or certainly not um, anywhere near as large, large as the medial rectus. And the medial rectus over on this side too we can see is, is very large and um, just touching there the optic nerve. So these patients will need intervention if the optic nerve is being compressed and there's a risk of loss of vision. For these patients who have compressive optic neuropathy and, and the optic nerve is being compressed, what we uh, can do, and this is one of the first line treatments, is orbital decompression. Now with orbital decompression, what's occurring is that um, walls of the orbit are being removed, and can be one wall or more than one wall, to create extra space for the globe and the extraocular muscle, and to prevent or stop the compression of the optic nerve, and therefore prevent um, any further vision loss or any vision loss. In most instances, um, the floor and or the medial wall are what are removed, but you can also remove lateral wall uh, or roof and um, the surgeon will um, determine what they think is necessary in that particular instance, but the preferred option is generally medial and orbital wall as you have the ethmoidal and the maxillary um, sinuses there to assist with creating space. So you can see that um, orbital decompression, however, with the prolapse of um, orbital contents and so forth, could uh, make matters worse in terms of strabismus in the long run, but it will prevent uh, vision loss. So this is a consideration that needs to be made. But again, orbital decompression is not performed unless uh, we have a severe case and the optic nerve is at high risk of um, uh, being damaged and vision loss is, uh, is very likely. Now, in general, uh, orbital decompression is is performed when uh, the patient is in the wet phase where we have the inflammatory process and the increase in the orbital volume and the enlargement of the extraocular muscles and thereby the threat of the optic nerve. However, be aware that orbital decompression is or can be utilised post um, the inflammatory phase, so post wet phase and into the dry phase and often for cosmetic and functional improvement and Again, the, uh, the surgeon will determine whether uh, orbital decompression is required in, in what's often titled the rehabilitation um, stage, which is where you're post-inflammation and into the dry phase and you're looking at how to assist the patient's diplopia and strabismus and um, any remaining issues post-inflammation. A few other options for patients who have optic nerve involvement include high dose steroids or immunosuppressants and then also orbital radiotherapy. Generally, uh, immunosuppressants are used in patients where orbital decompression is uh, contraindicated. Uh, not always, but um, it, because orbital decompression uh, remains for many surgeons a uh, first line treatment, then um, immunosuppressants uh, become second-line treatment. Another option is orbital radiotherapy. And um, in some instances, uh, there's a debate about the effectiveness of this, but it's generally utilised to uh, reduce the size of the extraocular muscles and thereby uh, free up room uh, within the, the orbit. Okay, let's move on now to patients who have their ox extraocular muscles involved in such a way that um, we now have a mechanically restricted eye. Now, um, I'm just reiterating from the last video the signs that we see in patients where we have um, restricted ocular movements. And what we see with these patients is that the restriction is mechanical in nature. It develops both in the inflammatory stage and in the uh, inactive stage. And the most commonly affected muscles are the inferior rectus and medial rectus, and then we also have the um, superior rectus affected, and the lateral rectus is very infrequently um, affected in, in thyroid eye disease. And below here, I've just listed again as a reference as we talk about the extraocular muscle uh, management options that 
The type of signs we'll be seeing in these patients is they'll complain of double vision. We may see a retraction of the globe, uh, given that we've got a mechanical restriction. And then other things on clinical examination is an abnormal head posture. Or, as we see with long-standing uh, deviations, we may see an enlarged vertical fusion range if the patient's had the thyroid eye disease and the vertical deviation for some time. Now, for patients who have mechanically restricted eye movements, we have a couple of options. One non-surgical and the other is surgical. Now, we don't want to surgically intervene until the patient is out of the wet phase, so they're past the inflammatory phase and they're into the uh, dry phase and the inactive phase. So whilst we're waiting for that point in time, what we need to do is uh, manage the patient's diplopia non-surgically. So we have options of prisms, occlusion, uh, teaching a patient to use an abnormal head posture if required, and then also um, Botox uh, can be used. With prisms, they tend to be quite successful, particularly if you have small angle uh, vertical deviations. Uh, but where you have marked incompetence, so large amounts of incompetence, the, the deviation changes depending on, on the position of gaze quite significantly, then it's going to be difficult for you to determine the prism that, or to find a prism that will give the patient a good area of BSV. So um, where prisms are, uh, fail, then you can look at occlusion and it might be total, it could be segmental. So if, say, for instance, the, the problem is primarily in abduction, then uh, you could put a segment in, in that area. With Botox, um, it's usually used in the wet phase, so the inflammatory phase, and um, the affected muscle is injected, and it is suggested that perhaps in the long run we could be reducing the amount of restriction we see by injecting uh, Botox into the affected muscle. In relation to Botox, uh, usually it's given if um, conservative measures such as uh, prisms are, are unsuccessful and often actually patients prefer prisms and, and occlusion to, to Botox. And lastly I have there that it can also be used to overcome surgical under and over correction. So where a surgeon has corrected the patient with thyroid eye disease, has intervened surgically but has undercorrected the patient slightly or overcorrected them, then uh, using Botox so that they can regain BSV and then lock into BSV is sometimes utilised uh, for these patients. Okay, moving on to strabismus surgery. Uh, this should be performed only, only when you have stability of the systemic condition. So we wait for the patient to be thyroid and it should only occur um, once the patient is out of the wet phase um, and into the dry phase and has a stable angle for at least six months. If orbital decompression is um, being considered, then uh, surgery for strabismus should always occur after decompression because you can imagine that surgical, sorry, um, orbital decompression can, can impact on strabismus. So you always want to do that procedure before you do surgery. So we wait for the patient to be your thyroid, we wait for stability and ensure that um, if orbital decompression is being considered, that does occur before any strabismus surgery um, happens. And when we're talking about strabismus surgery, we're now talking about actually working on the extraocular muscles and uh, recessing, uh, recessing them. The principle for surgical intervention of patients who have mechanical restriction is to free that restriction. And the way we free a restriction is to recess the muscle. So we want to perform forced duction tests in these patients, ensure that you have a tight muscle and you have a mechanical restriction and confirm that on the table or in theatre, if not before in, in clinic. Uh, because you have adults um, often uh, who are affected by thyroid eye disease, you can consider adjustable sutures depending on the surgeon whether that's something that they, they often do. And um, it is suggested, again, that you leave long-standing deviations slightly undercorrected. Again, these patients tend to have uh, enlarged vertical fusion ranges, and this is a good indicator to, to keep these patients slightly undercorrected. And um, finally, as per usual, with uh, mechanical restrictions, avoid resections um, as they tend to worsen uh, the situation. So in relation to surgical management and, and what muscles will we target, well, we 
we have to first know which muscle is causing the restriction, which is coming back to the FDT or the forced duction test and ensuring that we're aware of which muscle is contributing to the problem. Now, earlier we talked about the muscles in order of um, frequency of being affected. And it's generally the rectus muscles that are affected, starting off with the inferior rectus, followed by the medial rectus, uh, followed by the superior rectus, and lastly the lateral rectus, which is, is infrequently affected. So um, here you have a list of the general categories patients fit into. So generally speaking, a couple of things may happen. One, because the inferior rectus is the most commonly affected muscle, we will have limitation of elevation. Now remember that with mechanical restriction, the limitation is in the opposite direction um, of the action of the extraocular muscle that's affected. So the inferior rectus is a depressor, and so what you'll usually see is limitation of elevation. So firstly, one of the most common things we'll see in thyroid eye disease is limited elevation, and therefore the inferior rectus is tight, and we're going to res um, recess that inferior rectus. The next uh, possibility is the medial rectus being affected, in which case um, we will have um, limited abduction. And we could also then have a combination of both the inferior rectus and the medial rectus, in which case we'll have elevation and abduction affected. And then we have to consider the possibilities that both eyes are affected, not unilaterally, but bilaterally. So we could have a combination of bilaterals or bilateral inferior rectus, um, a bilateral medial rectus, a bilateral um, inferior rectus and medial rectus. And lastly, the least common um, or the less common uh, possibility is that we have a restriction in down gaze from the superior rectus. So um, these are broadly some of the main categories of patients that you will see. But um, there's no need to remember that in any detail. Just remember that the most common um, issues we have is elevation can be limited because of the inferior rectus, abduction because of um, the medial rectus, and depression because of the superior rectus. And we will target surgery accordingly. And this could be unilateral, bilateral, concomitant, asymmetrical, uh, depending on the situation. I don't have there the lateral rectus because it's so infrequently affected, but clearly if the lateral rectus was affected, then a deduction would be uh, where we'd see the limitation. So in each of these instances, what we will do is recess the muscle that is restricted. So in the first one there where we've got a tight inferior rectus, recess the inferior rectus. In the second one there where we have a tight medial rectus, recess the medial rectus. In the third one there where we have a tight inferior rectus and medial rectus causing both issues for elevation and abduction, recess both the inferior rectus and medial rectus. And now as we move into the bilaterals, a bilateral tight inferior rectus, recess both of those. So really it's just a matter of working out what's restricted and freeing that restriction by recessing that muscle. Here uh, is a summary of what we've just discussed where um, if you've got thyroid eye disease, you have a restriction in elevation. This is called by, caused by a type inferior rectus, recess the inferior rectus. Where abduction is affected, um, you have the medial rectus that's tight, recess the medial rectus. Where down gaze is affected, it's the superior rectus and it's tight and so we do a superior rectus recession. This can all be confirmed, or the tight muscles can be before can confirmed, sorry, on forced duction testing. And here I've just given you some indication here that where you've got a unilateral issue, you do unilateral surgery. Where you have bilateral concomitant deviations, you can do bilateral surgery. Um, and I've just got there, if it's small in size, then yes, consider um, doing uh, unilateral surgery rather than bilateral. And if you have incommodant or significantly incommodant strabismus, um, so it's bilateral but very asymmetrical, then consider unilateral surgery and you operate on the most affected eye um, to begin with. And you can do this staged wise, so if you need to do a second operation, you could. Um, or if you have a residual uh, deviation, then you can Botox and, and see if you can lock patients into, into BSV. Okay, and in this final slide, I have an overview of the various treatments we have in thyroid eye disease. So the first column includes um, the medical treatment from the endocrinologist management of thyroid dysfunction if present, to lubricants uh, for corneal exposure or drops, to immunosuppressants and radiotherapy for patients who uh, have optic nerve compression. Then we move into non-surgical um, options for diplopia. 
uh, and we have prisms, occlusion, and abnormal head postures. But again, we also have Botox as an option uh, for patients with um, extraocular muscles being affected and restrictions uh, being present. We can also use um, Botox in the wet phase for the levator and to try and prevent um, corneal uh, exposure or further corneal exposure. Then we have um, surgical intervention, and uh, I don't mention here, uh, but obviously thyroidectomy is an option where a patient's actually being um, uh, has thyroid dysfunction that warrants a thyroidectomy. But in terms of eyes, I have here, we've got uh, tosorophies for uh, corneal exposure. We've got uh, disinsertion of uh, Muller's muscle for lid retraction, lid lengthening for um, uh, lid retraction, and then we have orbital decompression when the optic nerve is at risk. And finally, um, strabismus surgery, which should only ever be performed uh, in the dry phase and post any orbital decompression surgery. And uh, as we just discussed, that will uh, involve uh, freeing restrictions and recessions. Okay, that brings me to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.